much. This is a um, preliminary paper on a larger project on the causes and consequences of depopulation that focuses on frozen conflicts and de facto states in um, Eurasia. I want to acknowledge support um, on earlier work feeding into this from a Minerva grant with Ralph Clem and Eric Heron, as well as a Norwegian Research Council grant with Gare Flick at the University of Oslo on national identity in Ukraine. Um, this is uh, preliminary work. It's a perfect um, follow-up to Brianna's wonderful presentation, primarily because I had hoped to present some survey data that we were all set to field in Apazia and in Luhansk. When COVID hit, um, it all went south. So I'm going to give you a bird's eye view of some macro level um, uh, data on depopulation in these de facto states. My three goals for this are to really highlight the idea of rapid depopulation processes in Eurasia. Um, over the past 30 years in several regions, you have small sub-state or de facto state regions that have lost almost half their population in the last 30 years. Uh, in uh, non-governmental controlled areas within Ukraine, the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic, population has also fallen rapidly in only seven years. Primarily, any depopulation that occurs that quickly is going to be driven, of course, by outmigration, displacement, and I would argue also by opportunity structures created by passportization from the Russian Federation. In addition to just the size of the populations in these these de facto states. I think it behooves us to pay attention to alterations, not just in size, but also in ethnic composition. Um, as we find depopulation occurring across regions, it is not just the numbers, but also the um, constituent identities of individuals in specific regions that may cause um, demographic concerns. My second goal is to really highlight the role of political instability as both a cause and an effect of depopulation. Um, this is not just due to outmigration, but also because of the way in which political instability calls into question fertility, as Brianna so well um, illustrated, but also quite importantly, the way in which political instability and low state capacity really hampers health and healthcare, feeding into mortality as well as fertility making decisions or fertility decision making, excuse me. Third and final, I wanna look at the role and motivations of external actors in micro area depopulation to really think about depopulation as something that external state actors can leverage for their own political goals and means. So what, what are we talking about in terms of de facto states and frozen conflicts? There's a million different ways to look at this. There's a huge literature, particularly in political science, but it is not a topic that many demographers have engaged with. Of course, de facto states are really looking at states, conflicts between states and separatists Separatists taking over territory, recognizing fairly stable lines of separation. They may move back and forth a bit as in the line of conflict in Ukraine, but in general, there are borders between breakaway regions and their former states. Claims of self-determination by the breakaway region, and this is important, a non-recognition of these supposed states or these de facto states. These are not states that are recognized by and large by the international community. And while Grant in 2017 highlights the idea of settlement and resettlement processes, many political scientists and legal scholars have really focused kind of on population exchange. When a breakaway region goes away, some people will leave and other people will come in. Um, what I would argue is that we need to rethink the dynamism of the settlement and resettlement processes, in addition, add three more more demographic characteristics to look at the duration of the hostilities, the longer they go on, the more um, population tends to decline. We need to look at the role of external actors, particularly in providing opportunity structures for migration. And we need to rethink this idea of frozen conflicts 
they're far from frozen, even if they are at political impasses and are dotted over time by ceasefires, they are marked by incredibly dynamic population change. And overall, the patterns that we find are that they are marked by massive depopulation. So here are the basic case studies that, I want, that I'm looking at in this larger project. First in Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, they have their own capital. They've declared independence quite some time ago. They are barely recognized by a few states other than Russia. Their local currencies tend to focus on the Russian ruble, even though ostensibly states like Abkhazia have minted their own currency. But ironically enough, the currency is printed by the Russian state mint and then shipped back to Abkhazia. So they're definitely um, very tightly linked economically to the Russian Federation. Of course, um, Artsakh Republic or Nagorno-Karabakh um, again, is a continuing conflict that runs hot and cold, but has been going on since the early 1990s. Um, while ostensibly Az Azeri control is going to be reasserted in the, the, the region, the, the final outcome and final um, solution, shall we say, in this region in terms of control is still far from clear. In Moldova, we have the Transnistr um, region that for more than 30 years has existed as a border region between Moldova and Ukraine that is not recognized as part of the Moldovan state and is, again, not recognized by any country, not even Russia, even though um, uh, Russian banks are providing their um, ISO numbers to Transnistria because Transnistria doesn't even have status to get a number for international bank transfers. And then, of course, as we previously heard, we have the Luhansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic in Ukraine. Um, since May of 2014, they have separated from uh, Ukraine, they are only recognized by another de facto state, Sasasetia. They recognize each other as independent states. Russia will recognize their regional documents for car registration, birth certificates, marriage certificates, but they have not recognized them as actual governments. And in both regions, the ruble continues to be the main currency, um, much more than um, Ukrainian currency. Overall, across these regions, we've had tens of thousands of people displaced during these long conflicts. Um, IDPs um, sent into states formerly recognized by the breakaway regions, refugees in the cases of Donbass with almost 800,000 or more refugees from that region being registered in Russia over the past seven years. In Nagorno-Karabakh, we have almost 700,000 IDPs being sent into Azerbaijan, particularly in the earlier periods of the war. Um, this includes several hundred thousand children who were born to IDPs or, or in Azerbaijan from Nagorno-Karabakh. About 72,000 IDPs go into Armenia. So you have huge displacement and people leaving at the same time, for those who remain in these breakaway de facto states, you have an aggressive passportization process that takes place spearheaded by the Russian Federation. In 2002, Russian Federation law was changed to afford Russian passports for all former Soviet citizens, regardless of where they lived. Therefore, people who had previously identified as having Soviet passports which was quite a lot of people in um, just 11 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, they didn't have to leave Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, the Donbass, or Nagorno-Karabakh to get a Russian passport. Now, it's not, on, not clear how long this offer will stand and to what extent Russia will continue to let people in these regions enjoy dual citizenship. But by 2021, over half of the people in Abkhazia and Transnistria 
possessed Russian Federation passports. In the Donbass, efforts at passportizatia started a little later in 2019, but most recent reports point to over half a million Donbass residents. So these are the people who are still in these breakaway de facto states hold Russian passports. And I think that this is a really important idea because what this does is provide the opportunity structure for people to leave either temporarily or permanently and seek um, uh, residence within the Russian Federation. Very quickly, the population decline in these de facto states has been enormous. In Abkhazia and South Ossetia, we find that Abkhazian population between the 1989 last Soviet census and the 2011 Abkhaz census, which again was um, questionable and thought to overcount the population markedly, what we find is you have a drop of almost 50%. In addition to the much smaller population size that is documented in 2011, we find that not surprisingly, Abkhazians increase from 17.8% of the population to just over half, with the proportion of um, uh, Russians also declining markedly, surprisingly enough, and the number, the proportion of Georgians or Mingrelians, these are summed in both measures here, um, even though they would argue they're very different identities, the proportion of Mingrelians and or Georgians increases just slightly, but really you see a huge ethnic shift. Similarly, in South Ossetia in 1989, you have just under 100,000 people living there. By 2015 in the South Ossetian census, again, I put quotes on the census part, the official reported population is just over half that of 53,000. And again, you shift from two thirds Ossetines to, over, to just under 90% Ossetine in terms of ethnic composition. In Transnistria, two, minutes, two yep, minutes left. Thanks so much. Um, you also find a huge decline, not quite as, as marked as our other, um, our previous cases, but we see over, we have hundreds of thousands of, of people missing between 1989 and 2015. And again, slightly different, uh, slightly more stable ethnic identification. In Nagorno-Karabakh, from 1989, when you have just under, under 400,000, the 215 Artsakh Republic popula population estimate and this is by ethnicity, even though it's all Armenian, <laughs> goes down by more um, than 50% to only 145,000. So overall, what we're seeing is that a very rapid outmigration is occurring. I wish we had very detailed information on age structure changes, but those data are very difficult to come by. The data that have been published are very, very curious and don't really add up. What we can say is that these are micro areas of extraordinary depopulation and much and certainly worthy of additional attention. Drawing on my um, colleague's previous uh, presentation, there is a focus on fertility, not surprisingly, across the de facto states. In Nagorno-Karabakh, they had, of course, the mass weddings of 700 couples in 2007. They've had subsequent child payments that increase with the parity of birth. But overall, fertility, while under Armenian control, remained fairly low. There is some evidence for Azerbaijan that IDP fertility was a little bit higher. Um, I would argue part of this has to do with the fact that Azerbaijan really subsidized IDPs from Nagorno-Karabakh, giving them preferential housing, preferential education access, and monthly payments. On the other hand, there's also excellent work by Torisi arguing that perhaps the higher fertility from Azeri IDPs had to do with compensatory behavior. Again, on the fertility, Abkhazia outlawed abortion in January of 2016, primarily because of concerns over a declining fertility rate, and Transnistria has been engaged in pronounced fertility pronatalist propaganda since 2010. Um, and these pictures are simply um, a brochure put, put out by Luhansk um, People's Republic, where 
your child gets its picture in the paper. Um, and again, this idea of an overall pronatalist policy really pushing increased fertility in order to compensate for the drastic decline in population. And one of the factors there is health and health care. Data are quite scarce, not surprisingly. And what data do occur don't seem to quite add up. Um, Death by cause seems quite different in mass in massive indicating a massive improvement from pre-conflict periods. It doesn't really pass the um, reliability test. We know that the conflict deaths across these de facto states really played a minor part of the population decline. These are not conflict deaths that are leading to depopulation, it's out migration. There are large numbers of the civilian and military populations that are disabled from conflict over the past three decades and therefore would need health and health care um, services. There's little data to see how well they are being served in terms of mental health issues and post-traumatic stress disorder. There's been very, very little work done, but indications in popular press and certainly by NGOs point to substantial mental health concerns that are not addressed and infrastructural challenges abound. In previous work, we've um, documented the bombings of schools and the destruction of um, hospitals, for example, in the um, Dunbas. Infrastructural challenges remain in Abkhazia as well as Transnistria, who've had places like hospitals um, destroyed during periods of conflict and never rebuilt. Right. Um, lastly, there's huge, massive outmigration of healthcare workers. Many argue that they were the first to participate in the passportization scheme, and um, estimates in Abkhazia are that 82% of all medical workers from Abkhazia pre-conflict are now resident in the Russian Federation. Um, lastly, because they are not recognized by international agencies or by other countries. Um, the COVID challenges in these de facto states also are extraordinarily um, serious. They are COVAX exempt because they cannot be part of the World Health Organization. The DPR, um, Donetsk People's Republic, Luhansk People's Republic, Abkhazia and South Ossetia are receiving limited Sputnik doses, but the numbers are fairly small and the um, vaccination uptake rate is also quite low. So overall, four big takeaway points. First, I think it's important for us to think about depopulation in terms of the role of outside actors. They can assist or provoke depopulation processes. In this case, I bring up passportization as, as um, a clear example. I also want us to think about depopulation as both a cause of and a reaction to low state capacity. This is particularly true in terms of bureaucratic state capacity, having school systems open, providing health care, providing social welfare payments in a, a plausible way. Depopulation can um, result from the persistence of low state capacity. Thirdly, depopulation alters ethnic compositions. And this is a challenge that we should be thinking about as we look forward in um, to the future of depopulation re regions. And then lastly, frozen conflicts, so to speak, generate dynamic population changes. And this really thinking about this, I think can provide us unique insights into small area depopulation. And so, as with um, our previous presentation, the data challenges in this region are immense, um, particularly in states that don't necessarily wish to document their population processes um, due to um, uh, uh, status concerns. But as we look to depopulation and its effects, these de facto states give us ex extraordinarily rich possibilities for examining how rapid and pervasive depopulation affects state capacity and everyday life. Thanks so much.